Well, good morning again. Um, I'm excited today. It may not sound like it. I'm a little tired this morning, so I apologize. Uh, but I really am. I'm, I'm very excited to uh, introduce some special guests to you that are here with us this morning. Uh, many of you know, well well before my time here, this church has uh, been in partnership and has been supporting a ministry in Belize, a boys Votech school. Um, and certainly, uh, I, I think they would say that it's not uh, just the school that they support, but it's a a pastor and a family that they love dearly that is faithfully serving the Lord in Belize. And so I'm very thankful uh, this morning that Pastor Frankie and his son Asher are here with us. Um, you'll, you'll know who Brother Frankie is. He's the one that's got a deep Southern accent, okay? So just bear with him. Um, he's from the South, and so he sounds a little different uh, than, than we do. Uh, but I'm thankful to have him. I'll be honest, I, I really wish that he didn't preach at all this morning. I wish y'all had someone else, and me and him just got to hang out all morning and talk about ministry and life and what's going on in Belize and how the Lord is moving. And um, selfishly, I'd love to just have him to myself and be able to talk about what, what Jesus is doing in Belize. But uh, the Lord has saw fit for him to be able to preach and share with us this morning. So a couple weeks ago, um, he emailed me and said, hey, I'm going to be around. Uh, just want you to know that I'm going to come and worship with y'all and be able to see some friends. And I said, why worship with us when you could preach to us, brother? And so uh, he, uh, he agreed to do so and to give us some time uh, this morning. And so listen, I don't know what all uh, Pastor Frankie's going to share, but let me just say, I've, I've only known him for a couple of years. Um, I've only gotten to go to Belize once. I'm a little upset about that, but um, I, uh, I'm certainly proud to know him and call him my friend. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing him this morning. But listen, his story is powerful. Uh, he went to school there as a boy, one of the first students, went back after uh, wrestling through some things in life and calling from the Lord and uh, is in Belize leading that school, leading these young men pastoring a church, faithfully serving his family, loving on that community. I really could talk about him all day. Um, not quite as much as I could talk about Jesus, but I could talk about Pastor Frankie. But listen, I'm certainly honored to introduce Pastor Frankie to you this morning. Will you give him a warm welcome as he comes to share with us this morning? Absolutely. Thank you, brother. Good morning, everybody. No, 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 no. Let's try it again. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. That's a little better. I know it's a little early, but yet God is still good. Um, as Pastor Danny shared, you know, we have been partners with this church for quite a long time. You know, even before his time when, Pastor, when Brother Ronnie was here, um, this church, First Baptist Saltillo, has been a staunch supporter of the school where my son and myself, we serve as the director and the administrative um, assistant. That is my son, Asher Wade. And he normally accompanies me on, on these trips. Now, some people say that he's got next. Well, the truth is I don't know what next he got, but he sure has next because the next generation has next. Now, it's a pleasure and an honor for me to stand before you to simply say first and foremost, that my school, Global Outreach Belize Votech, we owe a debt of gratitude to First Baptist Saltillo for over the years for having been staunch supporters. You know, you guys have never failed. Every time we have a need, you know, you guys always show up and say, man, we got you. And not only that, not only do you send your resources, you know, you also send yourself and you go and you sweat for the Lord in Belize. Now, um, I was telling my son, um, I am kind of not used to what I've been doing in the past two weeks is in that I really feel as if my skin is asking me, are you alive? And the reason why my skin is asking me if I'm alive is because my pores have not opened up and my pores have not sweated in the past two weeks. <laughs> so my, my body wants to know, hey, buddy, are you still there? And I said, man, I'm still here, but I'm down here in the deep south, and nobody told me that it was going to be cold. Now, this may not be cold for you guys, but this is cold for us. You see, my wife, if she was here, she would be dead because she freezes at 60 and she dies. No, she freezes at 70 and she dies at 60. <laughs> so she would not have made it. Amen? And so, um, but it, it is an honor for me to stand before you and to just to share a little bit first of myself and then share about what God is and what God has been doing in Belize. You know, we serve the same God. It does not matter where we're at. 
there's one God, there's one people, there's one hope, there'll be one heaven, and there, there is always one calling. And what I found about God is that God loves people. I don't know why. I don't know why. Because there's some people, if it was up to us, we would not like them folks. Turn to someone beside you right now that, you know, you could say, if it were not for God. <laughs> no, don't do that. Don't, 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 don't do that. <laughs> if it were not for God. <laughs> no, but thank God for God. But, you know, what I found is that God loves folks, you know, and I wonder why God loves some crazy folks. He's just out bent out of shape about these crazy folks. So I like to say to people is that at my school, we, we minister to some crazy boys. And instead of, you know, these individuals working with you to help them, in most cases, they work against you. It's like they want to jump off that cliff and you're there saying, no, don't jump. And you have to literally fight them to not jump off that cliff. So that's just a little synopsis for you to understand what it is we work with. Now, my school, in essence, we are there to not so much rescue individuals, which is what we do, but more importantly, we want to show them the love of Jesus. And the good thing is that First Baptist Saltillo, you guys assist us in that. You know, and I've only been at the school for 12 years. 12 years ago, they called me and they say, you know what, we need someone to lead this school. Of course, I did not believe that that was part of God's plan for my life until God had to convince me that this is the path I have for you. You know, you were rescued by the same institution 40 years ago, 40 years ago. That was when our school started. 40 years ago, August of this year, 1984. Global Outreach Belize Botec opened its doors and it took in five young men. I was one of the five at 12 going on to 13 years old. And what, what that school did for me, and that is why I tirelessly serve, is that that school, through missionaries and through um, donor churches and through donor individuals, that ministry changed my life. For I was going to a life of crime. I was going to a life of guns. My best friend, he went and he led the Crips, and now he's dead. That was where I was heading. And there's two words, two favorite words of mine from the Bible that I love so much, but God. Two simple words. And if you don't know anything about Scripture, you must remember but God. You see, it was um, Joseph who spoke to his brothers in Genesis 50:20. We know the story of Joseph. And the brothers thought that they were going to destroy him. And when Joseph reached prominence in Egypt, God showed him all the things that you went through was meant for a purpose. Do not lose your pain. Use your pain because it was meant for a purpose. And when he saw his brothers in Genesis 50, 20, he looked at them and he says, you know what? I forgive you because you meant this for harm. And my favorite two words, but God. But God meant it for good, the saving of many lives. So I want you to understand that you have been and you continue to be part of the but God story. And the story continues, and it did not finish with me when I graduated in 1989, but the story continues. That institution, just a quick report, and then I will give you a, a short little um, words of encouragement from, from the Bible. That but God story has seen 262 individuals, 262 young boys who would not have had a hope, who would not have had a chance. We have graduated up to this year 262 young men who are in the country at the moment. I am not unique. There are many more stories like mine. And they, what they are, are they doing is that now they have a hope. These are young men who are leading in the country. They have businesses. They have wives. They have families. And that would not have been possible if it were not for the but God. So I guess what I'm trying to say to you at the very beginning here, don't be afraid of continuing to be a part of the but God story. One. And two, it doesn't matter what you're going through, what people have put you through. There is always a but God. You see, when people design to bury you, when people use dirt to bury you, don't worry about the dirt. 
you take that dirt and you give that to God. Because while Satan uses dirt to bury you, God uses dirt to plant you. Never forget that. So God need that dirt. Take that dirt. Accumulate that dirt and say, God, here it is. They're trying to ruin my business. Here it is. They're trying to ruin my family. Here it is. They're trying to ruin my reputation. Here it is. They're trying to ruin my marriage. Here it is. You give that to God. And for your own personal story, you will also have a but God. So that story and that project continues even to this day. And I'm just honored to go back to the school that has given me a life and to just give it all that I've got. And why do I do that? For the simple fact that it helped me when no one else did. So with that said, I just want to encourage you this morning to continue to be a part of the but God story. God has blessed me. He's blessed me with a lovely wife. We met when she went on the mission field. She is from the island of Trinidad and Tobago. And for 30 years, we've been married for 30 years together. Together we've been serving the Lord. For 30 years, we've been serving the same church, Living Waters Fellowship Church, which was formerly River of Life Church. And it's an honor that in those 30 years, God side fit to bless us with some lovely children. Now, God has a sense of humor because he decided to, just as how the animals went in two by two, God decided that my wife should bring out children two by two. And so we have two sets of twins. Once again, God has a sense of humor. And I'm not laughing. <laughs> <laughs> now the first set was okay. It's like, okay, God, not fine. You're good. I'm good. Of course, the first set was hard. You know, we have a story. I'd like to share this testimony because this is really poignant to my heart. Because sometimes we think that God makes mistakes, and God does not make mistakes. God knows what he's doing. He knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. So three years into our marriage, when we found out that we were pregnant and the first pregnancy was twins, of course, we were all elated until the bad news came somewhere around the um, start of the second trimester, leading up into the third trimester. One child was not growing. My wife's doctor said, we're going to have a problem. This child will not be viable. I think you know what that means. And the doctor said, I want to prepare you that while there are two in the womb, one will be stillborn. And he did everything in his power to cause us not to deliver the children in their private hospital. They wanted to send us to the public hospital. But our faith was strong. And we said to him, you know, God gave us two First, God promised us to, he gave us to, and two will come out. Just quickly to give you the story of Anna. Some, some of you know Anna. Some of you are about to get to know Anna. When my wife went into labor prematurely, I had to rush her to the hospital. And the doctor did his ultrasound, and he said, we are going to have a serious problem. What happened is that the child that was not viable was positioned first in the birthing canal. The bigger child, which was no problem. Every, every time we went and checked, that first child was good to go. And the doctor said, we may have to do an emergency C-section to save the mother's life because that child, if that child continues to present itself first, they may lose both children. So of course, now I'm thinking, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? Remember about God. What are you doing? So I prayed. I said, God, you promised me. You've never failed me yet. You've never failed me yet. And that's why I love that song. He will never fail. I love that song. I don't just sing that song. I sell out that song. I stop, pause, and I think about that song. Because he's never failed. Went outside, and I prayed, and I cried to God. I said, God, come on. You've done it before you could do it again. Went back in, of course, my eyes full of tears. My wife, she's just smiling, smiling like an idiot. <laughs> it's like, what's wrong with you? What, why are you smiling? And she said, it's going to be fine. Didn't you hear what the doctor just said? Are you on drugs? 
it's going to be fine. He said, it's going to be fine. So I'm there talking with my wife, and you know, we're looking at my wife's stomach to see the movement, and miraculously something happened. It's like her stomach went something like that, and the doctor eyes, and the midwife eyes, and the pediatrician eyes, and the two other nurses' eyes was like, it was the bigger child. Somehow, I don't know how the bigger child kicked the smaller child out of the park, and that bigger child said, I got this. Now, of course, that child had a big head, like, like her mother. <laughs> don't tell the mother I said that. <laughs> And so that child came first. And less than three minutes later, Anna came. Anna did not read for a whole minute and a half, I know, because I was holding my breath. To myself, no, she's dead. Just as the doctor said, she's dead. I said, God, you promised me. I didn't know I was holding my breath until I heard a piercing scream from the second child. Piercing scream. And then I started reading, she's alive. But the damage was done. The damage was done to her brain. She, 28 years old, my first set of twins, 28 years old, and Anna is um, probably at a grade two or grade three level. You see, she was born MMR, mild, mentally retarded. The thing with Anna, though, is that she can't read, she can't write. Anna leads worship at church. If Anna was here, she would be raising that hand and shouting hallelujah. And she'll be going and slapping all of you and saying, why you're not raising your hand and shouting hallelujah? <laughs> and I just love God. She doesn't love worship. She can't read. And so when they're doing their worship practice, they give Anna the paper. Why they give her a paper, I don't know. But it's a thing my crazy people do back home. And Anna just will take that paper and put it on the floor. And she just stands there and she's listening to the beat. She's listening to the lyrics. It's almost like she's downloading it. And then she smiles. Now I got this. She just needs to hear it once. And so Anna is a miracle child. Now I thought God made a mistake. So fast forward two years later, we went to the doctor, same doctor. And the doctor said, uh-oh. I said, oh, no. <laughs> he said, uh-oh. Oh, no. He said, yes. My wife again. Grinning like an idiot. <laughs> What's wrong with these wives? <laughs> I'm so happy. Excuse me, I need to go outside. I, I just need to go outside for a moment. And I went outside. Ah, I can't do this again, God. And I cried. I had a good old cry. I went back inside. And my wife looked at me, grinning again. That, that stupid grin on that face. You, and she said, you were crying, weren't you? I said, if it happened to you, you would cry too. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's a song. Some of you know the song, some of you don't, and I could tell. But, you know, just to show that God made no mistake, then it was Asher and his twin sister, Aronel, and they were by the book. And years later, I asked God, God, why did you give me a special need child? He said, because that's the only way I could have gotten your attention. This was years later, and God taught me something. God taught me that life is lived forward, but it's only understood backwards. You see, my wife and I, we've been involved in a special needs ministry for the better part of 14 years. And it's one of few ministries that cater to special needs. And what God was saying is that I needed somebody to reach this group of people. And what better way than to give you a special needs that? And God showed me something. He said, I don't make mistakes. This was for a purpose. This was for you to use your special need data. Use the talents that I will download into your wife and into you. And I want you to minister to this group of people. These are what we call the least of these. These are the people that no one thinks about. These are people that mothers and um, fathers try to hide at home. And our job is saying, no, don't hide them. Bring them out. We want to help them. We want to work with them because God loves them also. So just quickly, you know, um, that's a little testimony that I just sent that I had to share with you. What I want to do this morning is that I want to share with you briefly, you know, there is a song. I think some of you 
who are kind of more mature. I won't say like Danny, who are, more, who are older. He would say that. I won't say that. You know? And you know the song, um, it goes something, born to be. There you go. You just showed us your age. Now these young people are like, what? I don't know that song. You know? It's like, born to be wild. Boom. You know? Now, um, of course, I've listened to the song. I kind of like the song. Um, I don't necessarily agree with the song. All right? But hear me and hear me good. It doesn't matter how you were born. It doesn't matter why you were born. The Bible tells us that you must be. You must be. You must be born again. So based upon that, and based upon a scripture that I'm going to share with you, God spoke to me and said, son, everyone must be reborn to, because there's a purpose for your rebirth. If there was no purpose for your rebirth, God would get you saved, and then, Scotty, beam me up. Some of you, once again, know what I'm talking about. All right, Scotty, beam me up. Beam me up, Scotty. I'm done. Amen? I'm done. I'm finished here. All right? But I want to share with you briefly on the topic that you were reborn. If you are here and you know Jesus Christ, you were reborn to serve. Now, Jesus has a concern. And we see his concern in Matthew chapter 9. Quickly turn there for me, and we'll give you three pointers, and we will see how we can finish here this morning. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 36 and verse 38, we can start from verse 35, where Jesus... Jesus went throughout all the cities. Matthew 9, verse 35 to verse 38. So Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages. And this was in Galilee. And he taught in their synagogues and he proclaimed the good news. He proclaimed the gospel of the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. His word and his works were reflecting that he was the Messiah. When Jesus saw the crowd, when Jesus saw the crowd, one translation said, when Jesus saw the people, he was moved with compassion and pity for them. He was moved with compassion and pity for them. When he saw and he was moved, he saw and he was moved, he saw and he was moved, he saw and he was moved. I will be challenging you to open your eyes and see. I will be challenging you not to move overseas, but to move across the road. I will be challenging you not to move in foreign mission, but to move to that child down the hallway that's in that room that may be sulking, that needs a father, that needs a mother to sit down with them and let them know it's okay. It's a crazy world, but I've been through this world. I've overcome this world. I want to help you, my child, who seems to be confused about this world. I want to help you, my child. I want you to move. So he was moved with compassion and pity for them because they were dispirited. They were distressed. And he said, these are people like sheep without a shepherd. He quoted Zechariah chapter 10, verse 2. He said, these people are like sheep without a shepherd. And then he turned to his disciples. If you are here, and you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, you, you've accepted him. At the point of salvation, at the point of accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, you also became a disciple. So he turned to them as I'm about to turn to you. He turned to them and he said these words. I like to say to people, in your Bible, if it's red, it bled. If it's red, it bled. And the only one who bled was Jesus Christ. The only one who will die for you is Jesus Christ. I tell my children, I'm not going to die for them. I don't love them that much. <laughs> no, some of you kind of like, looking at me kind of weird like. <laughs> I know some of you don't like your children. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Just quietly shake your head like this so no one can see. I, I don't like him. I don't like him. I don't like those children. No, I love my wife. I would die for my wife. No question asked. You, you are not touching my wife. I'm dying for her. But here's the thing, though. My crazy wife, guess who she would die for? Guess who would, she would die for? So let's say a man comes and he says he wants to kill Asher. Well, daddy will say, I'm sure he did something to, to deserve that. 
I'm sure he did something. Go, go right ahead. Go right ahead. My wife now, oh, no, you don't. All the crazy mothers here just raise them hand. Come on. You know you is crazy. Sherry, you know you is crazy. All right? <laughs> no, here's the deal, though. Here's the deal. Because on my wife, my wife will be jumping all over us, or she will be throwing her body on him, and then now, oh, shucks, man. Then the fool mess with my wife, and guess what I will have to do? Now I got to get involved. Now I got to get involved. If it was just the boy, I don't worry about the boy. You do what you want with the boy. But now you're messing with <laughs> anyway, but now you're messing with my wife. So anyway, so Jesus turned, you know. So Jesus would die for you again and again and again. Over and over. I don't get that crazy kind of love. But I love it. And I'm the recipient of that crazy kind of love. So I like to say if it's red, it bled, and the only person who did that, and that that was some years ago. How I help myself to understand when Jesus is speaking. I, I help to understand by reading scripture that once I see it in red, my thing is, if it's red, it bled. And that's my Jesus speaking, baby. And when my Jesus speaks, my sheep hear my voice. I'm a sheep. I know some of you looking at me kind of weird, like. But I'm a black sheep. <laughs> I'm still a sheep. Now, don't you dare call me no black sheep. <laughs> Just shake your head if you know what I mean. And I said, well, yeah, he, he's a black sheep, all right? And I brought my black sheep son with me. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so Jesus turned and he says, the harvest is indeed plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray the Lord of the harvest that he may send out workers into his fields. There are three things that I just want to quickly deposit in your spirit here this morning before we leave. Jesus cares. Just let that sella. Two simple words. Jesus cares. Now, I don't know if you know it, but we are called Christian. Really, it's a fusion of two words. It's Christ and Ian. The latter three letters describe the first letters, Christ. As Christians, we are supposed to be like, sad truth is that a lot of Christians act like Satan at times. That's to our shame. That's to our shame. You see, because we have a name, but sometimes we have not changed our game. Too often, our game is not matching the name. And I say to the people, if you're not going to change the game, then maybe it's time for us to change the name. You see, you will know them by their deeds. Christians should feel like Jesus. So Jesus feels, Jesus cares. Jesus never met a pain that he did not feel, and Jesus never met a hurt that he did not heal. And Jesus never met a need that he did not meet. He saw the people, and the first reaction is compassion. He didn't reason, oh, you know what, they're in this position because they're lazy. This is true. Some people are hungry because they're lazy. Do you know that when Jesus fed the four and the 5,000, do you know that there were a lot of lazy people that were fed that day? He didn't say, okay, all those who are hardworking farmers from the south, you get to eat. And the lazy guys from the inner city, you get to starve. Hungry is hungry, whether you work hard or whether you're lazy. Hungry is still hungry. Them worms are still trying to chew up the, your, your intestines. And so Jesus never met a hurt. He never met a hurt that he did not heal. He never met a pain that he did not feel. And he never met a need that he did not meet. We should be the same as little Jesus's. There was a song that says, do something. And it talks about all the hurt and all the hunger and all the pain in the world. And then the, 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 the author was saying, and somebody must do something. Why doesn't God do something? And the, he answered himself. And it goes something like this, that's why I created you. 
Now I know that we talk about poor people. I was poor. I like to say to people, I was young and poor. Now I'm old. Some of you didn't get that. <laughs> I'm still poor. <laughs> I know some of you could identify, right? Man, I was young and poor. Now I'm just old. <laughs> But here is the deal. Jesus wants us to do something. He wants us to do something. And so he says, look onto the field. So there are three things that I want to leave with you here this morning. He says, look onto the field. The sad truth is that the church has gotten comfortable. We've gotten comfortable because God has blessed us. And with the blessing that God has given to us, we start to accumulate stuff for ourselves. And we become like that rich young ruler who didn't know that that very night, who didn't know that that very day that he was going to die. So we have all these things and we're building bigger barns. We have bigger homes. We have more toys. We buy more tools. Good for you. That's all fine. You see, God's is not beyond blessing. As a matter of fact, it's because of the blessing of God that we're able to do the things that we do. Amen. But don't forget the purpose for the blessing. You are blessed in order to be a blessing. It's the Abrahamic promise and covenant. God told him, I will bless you so that you can have a whole lot of stuff, so that you can sit back and relax yourself. No, he said, I will bless you, and then through you. I want to thank you guys that because of your blessing that God has done, you guys have blessed us, and you continue to bless us. Every year, you donate to the cause. I want to say to you, you're doing the Abrahamic covenant and the Abrahamic promise. I will bless you, and then through you, I want you to bless somebody. So what I'm saying to you is simply this. You know, we need to wake up. He says, wake up. You see, because the church is asleep, we don't see. And when we're not asleep, we have become apathetic. So sometimes I find that in my country, our church is asleep. They don't see. And then sometimes they become apathetic. They don't care. I pray to God that you never fall asleep. I pray to God that you never not care, that you always feel the pain, feel the hurt, feel the need. He says, I want you to look. So the first thing we need to do is look. And then he says, pray. Every single battle is first won on your knees before they're won on your feet. I pray about all things. I cry over everything. Pray about all things, cry over everything. He says, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Pray to the God who is in charge. But after you pray, please ask yourself, am I willing to be an answer to my prayer? Don't know if you know that God has a prayer. God has a need. And we see it in Isaiah 6. When God, God, and God were convening a meeting, an executive meeting, and it does not get any higher than God, God, and God. God, God, and God had a problem. And I said, man, I have a problem with my homies that I created down there. And I need somebody to go to them. I need someone like them. God will not send an angel to attend to the needs of a human, but rather God will send a human to attend to the needs of a human. Does that make sense to you? And so the question was asked, whom can we send and who will go for us? Little Isaiah, he was eavesdropping, he was minding God's will because it was not a meeting with him, it was a meeting um, amongst the big guys, God, God, and God. And Isaiah uttered these words. He says, God, what about me? Now, at this time, you may think that I'm going to ask you to just sell all that you have and go on the mission field. No. No. That may not be your thing, and God may not be asking you to do that. Isaiah said, Lord, I will go. Now, what does that mean quickly? It simply means that I will position myself in such a way that whatever God wants to do through me to help those that God wants to help, I'm willing. Let me repeat that in closing. I will position myself in such a way that whatever God wants to do 
in reaching those that he loves, God, I'm willing. I'm willing. The Bible says that God could not do much there. When, this was one of the times when he cried over Jerusalem. He said God could not do much there because they were not willing. The Bible says, oh, how long I have yearned to gather you, just like how a hen gathers her chicks, but you were not willing. Go does not mean sell everything and go. No, it means position yourself and say, God, what would you have me do? Now, what would God have you do? Because you see, the ministry of the Christ, that's what Jesus must become the ministry of the Christian. The Bible tells in John 4, 38, I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and you will gather the harvest. What does that mean? I can't help but think that as we were driving here, my son was taking pictures. You see, we saw something that um, I have traveled in the salt here many times, but I don't think I have traveled in this time or in this exact season when it looks like your cotton is ripe unto harvest. As a matter of fact, as we were driving through Arkansas, we saw miles and miles of cotton fields, big old bales of cotton. And it comes to mind, look onto the field. It is ripe unto harvest. So the questions I have in closing is this. Who will see the last in these days? I've answered that. I say, God, I will. Who will pray? Because these are things God has asked us to do. He says, open our eyes and see. Who will see the last? I will. Who will pray to the Lord for the last in these last days? I will. Who will go if God says go for the last in these last days? I will. Who will give? Who will give to the cause of the lost in these last days? Sign me up, God. I'm there. Who will walk with the lost? Who will sit beside them, cry with them, hold their hands, hug them, touch the untouchable? God, I will. Who will stand with the lost in these last days? And try to direct them to Jesus. God, I will. Who will reap the loss in these last days? Because they feel it's right. Lives are on the three called salvation. Being ready to be saved. But God just needs someone to go to that tree and say, I will reap Frankie. A 67 years old lady came to Global sometime in about 1987. I was about 16 years old. At this time, I had been to the school almost two and a half to three years. I've heard about Jesus. Always preaching about Jesus, everything about Jesus. But it's interesting that I was never personally confronted. So I was ready to be harvested. And Miss Juanita Lovin, a lady who decided she'll go on the mission field, arthritic, stooped, and she would call us boys in at the school. Of course, I was taller than she was. She's a small little lady, and she said, Frankie, sit down. I won't be looking up to you all night. And with, in her gnarled hand, she held my hand. She said, Frankie, you've been at the school. You've heard about Jesus Christ. I have a question to ask you. If you were to die tonight, where would you spend eternity? In heaven or hell? I just started crying. Because I knew I'm going straight to hell. Going straight to hell. And she said, Frankie, you don't need to go there. You could accept Jesus right now. I can lead you in that prayer. And she did. A little 67 year old Juanita Lovin, who is now dead. She harvests my soul. Why? Because she was in a position to say, God, I'm willing. And she left. That is not only my story. That's many other stories. But it has to do with the church rising up and coming awake. And so this is my prayer for you. Don't fall asleep. See where God is working, Pastor Danny. And get in line behind God and say, God, I want to work with you. 
Can I pray with you this morning? Let us pray. Father God, I thank you for this congregation. I thank you, God, for the members and the leadership of First Baptist Salto. I thank you, God, for how they are already working with you in your kingdom. God, I pray, God, that you continue to give them one firm vigor. I, continue, I pray that you continue to give them, God, the vision. And God, would you, I pray a prayer of Jabez over them. Father God, would you bless First Saltillo, First Baptist Saltillo indeed. Would you, God, give them every single resource that they need. God, as they have purpose, I want to work with God to see the loss. I want to work with God to save the loss. I want to work with God to reap the loss. Father God, would you bless them indeed. Would you broaden the horizon? God, would you bless them so that through them, God, you can bless others. Father God, now we deposit these words. We deposit ourselves into your hands. We say, God, have your way. In your name we pray. Amen.